Right. I took them down. I, I was on yesterday. Okay. Yeah. We, see, we made a lot of the well, parts of tapes and yeah. the whole damn thing yeah. off the 701 line came to Nord. They got up. Most of the machine came off of 701. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you mentioned one of your diabolical schemes. Uh, uh, the the <laughs> diabolical <laughs> scheme that I, I, I was most yeah, impressed with, the slyest scheme uh, re related to uh, maintaining 701s. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the Maintaining them and the, and, the, and the final test of them. Uh, there were no procedures set up, and we didn't know how you test a computer to uh, make sure it works. Uh, and so, uh, and we had these 30 people that we'd hired with, ma with fresh master's degrees in electrical engineering, and they were to go out and maintain them. And so, and you didn't know how to test them, and nobody did. And so, what you did was to have this form that had to be signed before a machine could be shipped. It was the authorization to ship it. And it was signed by the two engineers who would then get in an airplane and fly out and receive the machine and make it run in the customer's uh, shop. That's what you call motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I missed the first part of this, but I vividly recall <coughs> that, uh, after developing a, a fairly comprehensive group of diagnostic programs, we found that you could get the machine to where it would run those well, and you'd put a certain customer program in that would fall on its face. So we began to integrate some customer programs into the total diagnostic test package because they did things that, that we had not conceived in the earlier diagnostic programs. Well, and that, so it was an evolutionary thing of building up and, and selecting the most rigorous test patterns of programs. And along with, these, uh, along with these 30 young men we hired, the field supplied, I don't know, maybe another 20 or 30, Brought them in from offices all over the country, wherever the machine was going. Brought their families in. That was class Remember? two. Didn't Femmer run, <coughs> keep the uh, herd over Femmer ran school. Yeah. And then they, they worked on my third shift and got their experience, hands on experience. Hal Wolf. Hal Wolf. Hal Wolf. Whoever it was. And uh, <coughs> I remember George Hammer. 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 Who uh, was a field engineering rep there. Uh, <coughs> wanted their, those fellows to work on a first shift because they had their families move back to the Kipsy. <laughs> but I insisted <coughs> they do it on a third shift. But that's how they got their hands-on experience to take with them in the field, uh, on the test cells. That's important. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I'd forgotten it completely. But uh, it certainly was important that, that, they, uh, that, you, that even after we'd used up these first 30, uh, why there were still more jobs, and, oh, sure. and you brought them into the factory. Because I'm sure juries, uh, fellows like Boet, <coughs> Evans was in that group, and Pat Beebe and others. Well, they were to go out but come back to the lab. Yeah, but the, the field had to bring their own team in. Yeah, right. you got to be careful. The, 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 the 30 engineers <coughs> that we hired to come in and go out with the machines were not going to completely constitute the machine teams. It was always contemplated that they would be part of the machine team. <coughs> uh, there would be one or two of those engineers with each machine, right. but also there would be these regular customer engineers who, who we would bring back and put to a special school and, and, and then after a year or something like that the engineers would come back. It was always the plan we, to bring them back. We brought, we brought the best 604 field engineers out of the field. That's who had electronic experience. Brought them into the plant with their family. I'll never forget that. That was a, maybe a first in the company to move yeah. the wife and the kids and house them in Poughkeepsie for well, a, a year or so. And uh, stay right there and, uh, the and other back thing, in their cities with the machine. If the machine happened to be sold to the right city, <laughs> that was a problem too. <laughs> One idea that came late was that I took four of those guys, and Evans was one of them. I took four of them and said, you four are not going out with your machines. You will stay here because each one of you is expert in a particular area of the machine. Mm -hmm. And when the guys that are out in the field are really stumped, you're the guys that are going to get them out of trouble. And so they represent, they, they constituted a kind of a flying squad of experts. So that when any of the 18 machines got into real trouble that the local group couldn't handle, they'd pick up the phone and call this flying squad and they, they would go out. But uh, the, those guys were really developed in a hell of a hurry because they came in fresh out of college. They went to Coombs's college an hour a day. They worked seven or more hours a day helping to design the machine and then helping to debug it 
Designed all my tests. And right. then they designed the test equipment. The That's test exactly equipment. right. Mm -hmm. And then when the machines in the factory began to be built, we sent each guy down to debug his own machine that he was going to follow out into the field so that he would know its idiosyncrasies. And so that it, it was kind of a, a unique uh, that was good. Organization. Mm -hmm. Thank God we don't have to do business that way anymore. But uh, you know, one one unique thing that happened in that. Remember the consent decree? I guess it was some period of time. We had a product test department. Yeah, we and, had product. Yeah, but you know, they kept wanting me to give them a machine. Well, how would you give them <laughs> a whole computer and stick in another lab? And they uh, they had to do that on the line. They had to take our word for it uh, to do the product test because. Uh, we just couldn't move a whole system into another department. We didn't have enough to do it with enough machine. But they well, were frustrated. You were building up a, a big staff, and uh, obviously you, you had a perspective of a, of a market. And one of the things that I found interesting as I read in there was the uh, discussion <coughs> of the estimates that you made in each case before you put a machine out. You'd have to come up with an estimate of what the likely market was and you'd price it accordingly and so on. And of course, having been successful, you you often way underestimated. You went way way on beyond in many cases. Now, we we all we all know the stories about the people who who didn't believe in the electronic computers, saying, you know, five will do all the calculations the world will ever need, and uh, uh, there's no market because uh, for that kind of speed, you know, that, th these are old stories. And very interesting too, but you people, your group, which had faith and confidence in the in the real demand, must have also had some thoughts in the back of your head going beyond the immediate market calculations. In other words, you said, "Well, we can sell two hundred and fifty of these." That would be in an initial wave of two, three, four years and so on. What, what did you think of as, as the ultimate picture of the absorption of computers? How widespread do you think they'd be? What did you think they'd be? That's very, very <laughs> difficult to talk about. Let me tell you why. Yeah. Uh, there was really no market. The market was developing, <laughs> and that said it before. Yeah. The... The, if it hadn't been for the CPC creating these mathematical groups and a lot of the uh, uh, customers offices there would have been no market for even the 18701s that we built yep. once we built the 18 then there developed the market for many more yes. because now for instance when the Northrop company had a 701 and the Douglas company had a 701 and the Boeing company did not, and I don't know that that's the case, but it, it had to have one. There was no way an aircraft or airframe manufacturer could stay in business anymore if he didn't have an equivalent machine or better. And the reason is that the machine enabled them to do their design and their estimating on a much compressed time schedule and to a much greater degree of precision. Mm -hmm. It affected their business operations. Now, I can recall much later than the 701. The 701, remember, was 1953-54. Yes. And it was over. In 1955 or 6, I can remember being with the president of a big insurance company in New England who came to Poughkeepsie to look at the factory that was building the successors to the 701 and saying, well, I don't know whether I'm going to need this machine or not. I don't see why you guys are so excited about selling me one. One of these machines can do all the work I can ever conceive of my insurance company putting on it. And, you know, I'm absolutely as certain as I'm an inch high that that company today has probably 
10,000 times as much computing power, not yeah. twice or three times, but 10,000 times as much computing power within its walls as it had when that man made that statement. So the market for, for computing in that man's company did not exist at that moment. It had to develop. But did it exist in your minds? Well, all of us, especially Nat, yeah. all of us, but especially Nat, had a faith that more and more and more things were going to be done by computers. And, and it turned out to be correct. Nat, I would well, well, go ahead. Well, in, in particular, uh, I, I mentioned joining IBM because I felt that uh, this is where the action was going to be. And the main part of IBM's market was, uh, was handling commercial data processing. Yeah. That is, uh, uh, sales and accounting and all that. And uh, the tape, the magnetic tape project, was concerned not with the scientific application of computers that we knew about from other uh, other work going on all across the country in universities and government laboratories, but it was concerned with uh, the application to IBM's main line of business. And what we visualized at that time, the three of us, Dunwell and Buck Holtz and I, uh, was that computers would eventually take over uh, all of the large data processing operations. It was not possible for us to visualize a, a, a VLSI chip at that time. No. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, we, uh, we, 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 the transistor hadn't been invented. Yep. And, uh, or it hadn't been applied. It had, it had been just invented. But it hadn't been applied. It, it was a novelty, yes. Uh, and uh, and until, until, until two things happened, the, uh, uh, that I mentioned before, the magnetic uh, uh, the magnetic core, I magnetic think. core memory, and and the transistor came in. Uh, well, it wasn't really possible for the computer revolution to get going. Right. And uh, and then of course a huge impetus came from putting everything on a single chip. Um, but you did basically anticipate that that all the uh, uh, card mechanical card setups would be displaced. Uh, by uh, the, the much greater efficiency of a computer. No, no, uh, no. At that at that time, you see, we didn't, we, we had never, we, we couldn't visual. We since we didn't know about the transistor, uh, and we didn't know about VLSI. Well, you can't imagine replacing these things. Uh, what we thought was that in the large, all all of the large, the large, uh, the large operations like, uh, like like the insurance companies and so forth, which really have a very large uh, clerical operation going on, which was done by hand. I mean, most of the clerical work was done by hand, and some of it was done by machines. Yep. And, and it, was, uh, it was the amount of paperwork was increasing and the number of clerks were increasing to where there wouldn't have been enough population to carry the work on. And we visualized replacing all of this. And we knew, we knew about, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was at that point I understood about uh, Turing's work, but we, we, we knew computers could do the work that all those people were doing, and, and uh, the, the big operations. Uh, so, far as the, so far as VLSI is concerned, I don't know if you know, you can, you can, you can buy two chips today which, which do everything that the 701 could do. The mainframe. Uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the mainframe and the memory. One chip, one chip will do the mainframe and a part of the memory. Yeah. The two chips, you can get the, all the memory. Yeah. Of course, you don't have the magnetic tape or the printer or that's the card reader and all that. <laughs> <laughs> or the new generation. Uh, Matt, I don't know if, whether it would, the lights make you more comfortable here, but the camera people would rather if you sat over oh. there. I don't know. It doesn't okay. really matter, but that's your right. comfort is primary. Uh, no, this is a, yeah, the, reason, the reason I was sitting there is because I have a... I have a, a library of things to refer to here. Oh, well. that, my, memory, memory, read his memory, my memory doesn't read them. My memory does Let me give you really well. put that on a chip and you could carry it in your pocket. <laughs> That's right. Let me give you a cal another calibration point yeah. relative to this perception of what the market might be. In 1955 or 6, and I'm not clear on precisely which date, the teleregister company had installed at some of the airlines, especially American Airlines, what they called an availability system. And this was a system which kept track of a number of flights with regard to seat availability. It was not a reservation system. If an agent sold a seat, 
the agent would subtract one from the availability. It was a purely numeric system. And in 1955 or 1956, a guy by the name of Blair Smith, who worked for IBM, was a salesman for IBM, sat next to a guy named C.R. Smith on an American Airlines flight. <laughs> and they got to talking about computers. And they got to talking about computers and airlines. And out of that conversation came a conviction on the part of C.R. Smith, who, by the way, knew that the jets were coming and, you know, had contracted to buy them. And that he wanted to have not an availability system, but a reservation system. And so Blair Smith came back and talked this up at headquarters, and we had conversations between IBM and American Airlines, and finally we signed a contract that I was very enthusiastic about. And I can still recall being called into the vice president's office, executive vice president's office, and him asking me, why in hell are you so enthusiastic? Why do you want to get us so involved in, in, in a contract of this nature? And I said, very simply, because in order to solve this problem, we've got to solve the problem of large central storage, We've got to solve the problem of communication from a variety of cities to one central point. And we've got to design a terminal that the sales agents can use. And we've got to design a very reliable system. I said, it, it seems to me that if we can do these things, if we can technically achieve these things, there will be many, many things that we'll be able to do subsequently, but not until we solve these problems and learn how to work with the telephone company and learn how to handle equipment that is being used 24 hours a day and so forth and so on. And he said, fine, on that basis, we'll go ahead. And that contract ended up with the American Airlines Sabre system. It was the first really big application of magnetic disk files. It was the first commercial application of communication between terms. Sage had been the first. Yep. As a matter of fact, the word Sabre, acronym Sabre, we, we pilfered from Sage. <laughs> Sage was semi-automatic ground environment. And, and Sabre was <coughs> semi-automatic business uh, research environment or something like that. Pat Beebe took the name from one to the other. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> but we were determined that if Sage, you know, if we could take the principles that we were playing with in Sage and apply them commercially, that they would open up a number of commercial possibilities. None of them existed at the time. All right. And I can recall at a much later time when I was put in charge of the Advanced Systems Development Division in order to carry this project forward, amongst others, we had to invent the word teleprocessing. We had to invent it. It's curious that we, once we invented it, we, had, we found it had already been invented and was in use, and we bought it for something like $25,000. Really from home. It was a guy who was making mirrors that women used to make up with. <laughs> what do you call those? Uh, huh? Contacts? No, no, uh, a, like a table uh, with a oh, dressing table. Oh, dressing table. Like, uh, a like a triptych. Yeah, with the lights around it. Lights around <laughs> it. And, like and he no called that teleprocess. But he was very glad for twenty five thousand dollars to sell us the name. How we doing? At that time, and this was like about 1960, 59 or 60, everybody I talked to in IBM, <coughs> sales, had, what is teleprocessing? They couldn't quite understand what was meant by teleprocessing. Okay? And even though we had, in 1962 or 3, finally installed the American Airlines system, and by the way, it really made a big difference when the jets came in because the jets, you know, had an awful lot of passengers. Uh, 
when that was finally installed, it still didn't dawn on people that this technique, these technologies, could be applied elsewhere. <coughs> and to prove that point, I'll give you another vignette. Sometime around 1964, I won't tell you the guy's name, but I had a conversation with somebody in the sales operation, the marketing operation of IBM. And I was <coughs> madder in hell because teleprocessing still wasn't being sold, wasn't being really marketed. And I finally said, you know, Bunker Ramo is selling terminals to these people every stock brokerage outfit, every stock broker's agent has these terminals sitting on his desk. And the guy says, so what? And I said, but that's digital. He said, no, it's not. He says, that's our business in the brokerage is back office business. After the transaction is made, now we take care of the record keeping. That's our business. Okay, he still didn't connect the guy sitting at a terminal connected with a back office computer. So if the man could make the sale, query the computer, talk to the customer, make the sale, enter the thing into the main file and, you know, affect the back office. And I said, listen, Bunker Rainbow is going to start selling back office computers to go with these terminals. He says, oh, now that's our business. Okay. <laughs> So th this business of developing a market, you see, th there are hang-ups on the part of the, 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 the people you're involved with. And if you think those are hang-ups, there are hang-ups on the part of the customers who say, you know, well, I can recall talking with the stock exchange when we were doing a stock exchange system. Keith Funston. And I said to Mr. Funston one day, you know, we are building a system that pretty much will mechanize the present way you handle trades on the stock exchange floor. But there's really no reason why you should do this. The computer will do a lot more. And his reaction was, don't you try it. I know exactly what you're talking about, but we need those specialists on the floor to make a market. We don't want, we still want them to handle little pieces of paper they do so at the end of the day they can go like this. <laughs> In other words, he was very conscious of the fact that you could not change the habits of a lifetime with respect to people's careers like that. And so that market has taken an awful long time to develop. And you just, as a matter of fact, even now it's not fully developed. You know, there's no excuse for having a West Coast and a Midwest and a New York exchange. No excuse for it. A nationwide exchange could handle the whole thing. And they're just beginning to get away from the notion that you've got to have, you've got to have these specialists and so on. Like the NASDAQ people on their special, uh, what do they call it, their national market. I'm finally doing that. So the, the market, <coughs> the development of the market is a, a very weird and wonderful process that has to go hand in glove with the development of the technology. That even though some of the people who work with the technology can foresee some possibilities, if that marketplace doesn't cotton to it, it's not a possibility. But uh, in addition, you, you can never find out what kind of a new what, what what kind of a new machine to design by asking the customers or the salesmen. That's right. Uh, because all, all they all they, all they want is what they have, but a little better. Cheap and fashion. If, and if, and if there's, but if there's something radically different that's needed, then uh, it takes somebody uh, <coughs> who uh, can picture what the technology can provide, picture what can be created, and, and how this how this would fulfill a social role, and uh, and then you go out and try and get somebody to build it and try and get somebody to uh, use it, and little by little pro progress. Uh, occurs, but little by little, it's you know, inch by inch. I think my own personal perspective changed, uh, broadened rapidly I, <coughs> when I left the 701 and went with the Sage system mm. and looked at what the Air Force was doing. It was a real-time application, keeping inventory of everything in the sky, using a display output, 
And uh, I tried to get one of our programmers to take one of those displays, you know, and put it in my little office there so I could keep track of the inventory in a plant, you know, no one else. <laughs> and I said, my God, there's no limit to what these things can do in industry. And uh, uh, Sage, there was a lot of fallout out of Sage, you know, core memory, uh, some technical thing, but the display was the first time that, that was used as a, a tool to know what was going on. And, uh, well, I hope I've elaborated on your, your question with regard to what we had in our minds. I mean, I think Nat and, and a lot of us had a lot of, of potential on our minds, but it, it's just not that simple. You know, Nat, Nat, maybe you have an example or two of this uh, that, that led you to the generalization that you can't ask the user uh, to what he wants in the machine. What were, what were some of the occasions that, that led you to see that? Well, <clears throat> uh, people people just get set in their ways. Oh yeah. And uh, the way programming used to be done is that there'd be a, a big a big expensive computer uh, run by run by the staff of the computer. And then there would be programmers who would write programs in pencil, and they would go to key punchers who would <coughs> key, punch, key punch the programs, and then the key punch program would go back to the programmer who would take this thing and check it over and see if it still looked right. And uh, seeing it in a different form, while he'd see mistakes that he'd made, he'd see mistakes that had been made in key punching it. Then it would go in to the computer, and it would, a, a run would be made, and he'd get out a dump, which would be a sheaf of papers two inches thick, and he'd pour over this and figure out where, where he'd gone wrong. And uh, so this was a whole way that a whole generation of programmers grew up. And now came, came when we had uh, <coughs> machines with, with terminals on them and displays. Now terminals, first typewriter terminals. Why, uh, it's very difficult to get these people loose because you see, you're sitting at a terminal, you don't see as much information as you do if you have a big uh, uh, computer dump. And you have to change your habits rather drastically. And you would never, you would never find out that <coughs> programming should be done uh, uh, from a terminal uh, by asking programmers. And programmers, you know, are supposed to be fairly progressive people. And uh, but you, they, you know, they have, they have their own way of doing it. And, <coughs> and then, 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 when we changed from typewriter terminals to displays, uh, again, there was the same type of thing that the programmers resisted the change. With a typewriter terminal, what you do is uh, write a program, and you can see what you're doing. It comes out on paper as you work, and uh, and, and then eventually, uh, it uh, when when you get enough done, you then have a you then have the, the the central printer print print out a copy of the program, and then you can sit there at your terminal, looking looking through this printout uh, and making changes and get it fixed up right. Uh, but you work right online now. You can you can actually sit there and change something, and it changes it back in the computer instead of having to go through this process of which uh, of giving it to the key puncher and then having it go through the computer and getting it back a few hour, uh, two days later. while well, you do it right now instantly. But then then the idea is to change from that to a cathode ray tube, in which you don't have this printout here. Uh, uh, you don't have any paper at all, and it's much more efficient. But it's uh, very difficult to convince a programmer uh, to change his ways, and so the uh, the engineer, the engineer, uh, uh, or, or the planner, or the, we have IBM. We have different names for them. Usually, planner is, is getting in the in vogue now. Um, has to conceive of this way of doing it, and and conceive a product, and then uh, convince people to make it, and convince other people to use it. It's, I can give you an example out of your own experience. Yeah. <clears throat> the first conveyances, gasoline-powered passenger conveyances that were built were not automobiles. They were horseless carriages, mm -hmm. complete with buggy whip holders, mm -hmm. complete with buggy whip holders. They had tillers instead of steering wheels. They had every vestige of a horseless carriage, which is really what they were. And the automobile, as you and I know it today, functionally speaking, 
took a long time to evolve from the horseless carriage. And that's really a very good, pithy example of, of what Nat is talking about. That when you ask people what they want, what they want is a horseless carriage that doesn't have a manure-producing animal out in front of it. You know, that's what they want. It's still exhaust. You know, uh, <laughs> I've been in development and manufacturing throughout my career at IBM, but always in contact with the sales and the marketing people. And historically and even today, uh, they did believe, and I think they do believe today, that they know what is needed. They know what the customer wants. But it's always in the context of exactly what exists. It's more power, it's cheaper, it's uh, more reliable, something like that. Really, the market expansion seems to me has come through new developments like the disk file, or uh, large-scale integrated circuits, things like that, that just completely open up a whole new, a whole new frontier. And then people kind of quickly start spinning their wheels on that. But until that existed from some source, uh, it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the menu. It's very important for the salesman not to, not to be creative, but for them to sell what, uh, what we have yes. to offer. Yes. Uh, in other words, if if what we're if what we're manufacturing today doesn't get sold. Why, we won't have enough money to pay the engineers or pay the factories or anybody. Uh, and so the salesman is oriented to get out there and sell right now. I mean, the salesman never thinks, typically salesmen don't, don't think a year ahead. They think three months ahead. They have to meet quota. and then, Well, they do think a year ahead because they have to make, make quota for the year. <laughs> and if they make the 100% club, uh, then they'll stay, they'll continue to be IBM salesmen. And if they don't, if they miss it too many times, they'll be salesman for somebody else. Yeah. Long and, time uh, plan, long term strategic <laughs> planning is what's for lunch. <laughs> yeah, well, but also, also, also they will <laughs> immediately <laughs> continue to <laughs> <100 laughs> club, which is once a year. And uh, but they, they you know, if, if it's going to take eight years <clears throat> from taking some technology that we have now, and uh, to the time when a when a product actually shows up in a, a customer's office, uh, uh, coming off a production line, uh, why don't ask a salesman. He, he, his, his, all of his training is, is oriented toward selling right now and selling what, what's available. And that's what makes IBM go. Is one of the very important things that makes IBM go is that we have the best sales team there is. And, uh, and part, of, part of it is the way you train a salesman. But there's a good a, development team to keep coming up with new ideas. There's a, an article in an old issue of Think I'm going to bet it was around 1972, but I'm not sure, called The Future is Golden. You ought to get him a copy of it. It deals with this subject. I'd like to try a different tack um, and have you talk about yourselves. And we really would like to have on tape a feeling of where you came from, what you were interested in, in high school, earlier, people who may have influenced you, uh, how you got interested in technology, computers, mathematics, whatever and um, up to what got you into IBM, working on the 701, and then afterwards, starting uh, with you, Nat. Oh, well, uh, I don't know where my interest in technology began. Maybe it was that my uh, parents provided me with a very good set of wooden building blocks that fitted together nicely and has offered a lot of opportunity. But, uh, but one event, one, one, one very important event at a higher level was uh, occurred in Canada. My father used to take my brother and me fishing uh, uh, every every year. We'd go up to a, a lake in uh, on northern Ontario, and uh, again have a canoe and go out and fish. And when you pull a paddle back, it produces two vortices, one on each side of the paddle. And I kept looking at those vortices and wondering uh, what makes what makes that. <clears throat> so when I got back to Back to Buffalo, I went to the library and I, I got out a book that, on hydrodynamics. This is, uh, I guess, about a fresh uh, sophomore, sophomore in high school. And I discovered that it was, I couldn't read it very well because it was written in calculus. And so I got out a book on calculus. I found one that had all the answers at the end of the book. And I read that. And I worked all the problems. And uh, eventually, uh, when I decided to come to MIT, I... Uh, uh, I then got MIT's book that didn't have the answers at the end, and I read that. And uh, and I luckily I was able to pass off the first two years of mathematics uh, with advanced standing exams, and that just gave me a a, a big start. So, uh, 
and, and I, I was always interested in computers, uh, uh, the possibility of computers, and I visualized them as analog computers until uh, after the war. And I, I guess I, the, the war, the war got me into radar because I was working as a as a research assistant at MIT on the the blind landing or the blind landing project. This was the one that produced that came up with a glide path localizer type of blind landing. That's the main kind that's used today, landing for landing airplanes. In which lab was that? Uh, well, Don Kerr was the head of the project, and he was working under Bowles. Bowles, you probably remember. Don Kerr, you probably don't remember. No. Uh, and uh, and it uh, it was it was a contract for FAA. You know, it was a predecessor of FAA. Of somehow. CAA. Uh, C C C C C uh, Civil Aeronautics. It was called before the federal. Because I almost I, went to work for. Yeah, well, I think it was before was that. Oh, was it CAB? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, the uh, they they this project had started. And once a week, they had to feed a research assistant to this lion. It was Wheeler Loomis down in the radiation lab. <laughs> he was the he was the recruiting the head of personnel for a radiation lab. And so my turn came, and I wound up in radiation lab, and spent the early part of the year designing radar at um, in the radiation lab, and the latter part designing and building radar sets at Sylvania radar sets that had been started at. Uh, uh, and in their MIT radiation lab. And that led to a need to use these, this, this group that I had, which led to contracts with uh, the uh, with, uh, NSA, or a predecessor of NSA, uh, NSA, I guess it was, and also to the contract with um, MIT to build the arithmetic unit of, of world, design and build the arithmetic unit of Whirlwind One. And that got me into computers. Oh, there's a... Chris? Well, I was a customer engineer with IBM and an electronics officer in the Navy for almost five years. And uh, anything radar, radio, underwater sound. And when you mentioned radar, was a connection between radar and computers. It struck a chord with me a few hours earlier because that was really my entree into computers. When I came back at the end of the war back to IBM, <clears throat> I was in the field just for another couple of years when they began to develop laboratories like Poughkeepsie and looking for people that had that kind of experience. And of course, the pulse techniques of radar was really the, the heart of the early computer circuits. And I was fortunate to be transferred into Poughkeepsie Laboratory and joined Jerry's group within a short time. You know much of the story from there. I, I was very excited when to discover when uh, uh, Frizz came into the laboratory. Uh, I, I had a Gravely tractor. and. Uh, he had been the customer engineer for the Gravely Company in West, West Virginia. One of my customers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about earlier, Mr. Fizal, you didn't mention before? The Amateur radio. Amateur radio? Amateur radio, since I was about 13. Uh -huh. My current call is NI6Q. Uh -huh. And I have my computer and my amateur radio station tied together doing radio teletype, which I'm rather proud of. There aren't too many people on the air with that mm -hmm. these days. Uh -huh. but, uh, and then you went to college. No, I missed that. You missed that. Yes, I did. You went straight to IBM. Yes. Yeah. And uh, very fortunate to get in an area where if you could produce, you could get ahead. And uh, Jerry gave me, as I said on that film, he, he gave us our head and would let us do anything that we could do, and uh, gave us all the hours and all the fill with all we needed to do it. So I'm retired now after about 40 years at IBM. Mm -hmm that uh, had a long and interesting career. Well, oddly enough, I, uh, the only one in the room can say I was born in the same city that the computer business was born in for IBM. I was born in Poughkeepsie, some 25 years before the computer business. <clears throat> oh, early in high school, I decided I'd like to be an electrical engineer. My mother wanted to be a dentist because there was more money in it, but I went to the Clarkson Tech and then Graduated <coughs> in 40, 43 and went with Eastman Kodak on the uh, uh, <clears throat> to the Manhattan Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Worked there during the war. I got drafted after the Jap signed a treaty, the treaty, because I was still under 26. Spent nine months in the army and they dis discharged all the fathers. And I was commuting from uh, 
uh, Fort Monmouth to Poughkeepsie, where my wife was, during that period, I met Art Height, a fellow I roomed with in college. He was with IBM. I'm working on a typewriter. You remember Art? He's in Kentucky now, retired. And uh, spent some weekends and found out about this wonderful company that had come into Poughkeepsie while I'd been gone for <laughs> a number of years. And uh, through Art, I uh, came to work for IBM. Or, uh, for IBM, and uh, very shortly yeah. after that, <clears throat> started on a 604, well, the Carter type, but the, uh, started working on a 604. That's where I met Jerry. And uh, <clears throat> I worked both in engineering and manufacturing. I was back and forth a couple of times and was picked to uh, work with Jerry and build a 701. <laughs> Went on from there on the Sage system and from Kinks and I'm now living in Boulder, retired in Boulder, Colorado. Quite by accident, I came, became involved with the computer. Although I think I've had a great computer. Atom bombs and computer <laughs> have been my working life. Well, I guess while I was uh, still in... Uh, grade school I became interested in in uh, in radio you know kids get interested in photography and radio so I used to build these little crystal sets and one tube sets and uh, I determined at that point that I wanted to be an electrical engineer I was encouraged because uh, I didn't know any unemployed electrical engineers. I was during the Depression. It didn't dawn on me that I didn't know any electrical engineers. <laughs> but anyhow, I went to a, a special school in New York City called Brooklyn Technical High School. And that, that was a very fortunate choice of school. Um, they had a number of extracurricular activities. Uh, I used to belong to the physics club, to the radio club, and then I was most fortunate in, in coming in contact with a, a faculty member who was interested in organizing a television club. So he and I organized this television club. And we built a television set just in time to receive the opening broadcasts from NBC's experimental station on the opening of the New York City 39 World's Fair. Uh, this faculty member used to do consulting for a very small development company that was partly owned by uh, a relative of another teacher in the school, which is how the connection got made. And this company called the Automatic Telelector Company, was trying to develop uh, under its chief technical man, a man named Ward Leathers, a, uh, an automatic residential meter reading system. Gas meters, electric meters, water meters. Read them from a central point and uh, punch a paper tape with the readings and then designed the equipment so that you would, we never built this ladder equipment, so you could take this month's tape and last month's tape and subtract them and create a consumption tape and then do a table lookup after the subtraction in order to get the, the bill. Um, in any event, I used to, while I was still in school, uh, help this company out as, as an electrical wiring boy. And then when I graduated from high school, it was mid-year. New York City graduates in mid-year as well as at the end of the academic year. Uh, they asked me to come to work full-time. That was in January of 1940. And uh, by the time it came time to go to college in September, uh, Mr. Leathers felt I was valuable enough to his effort. He asked me to stay on for another year and promised that he would help me go to college if I did. So I did. And when I finally left, I left with a bonus of a few hundred dollars plus a contract that paid me forty dollars a month. 1941, that was pretty good money. Better in the Army. Better in the Army. <laughs> um, 
I had uh, been at college for maybe six months, seven months, when word came that the company had been bought by IBM and I was in the pickle barrel. So I now got my checks from IBM instead of, of this company. Up until this time, I had pretty much figured out that I wanted to make my career in television. I, I had thought television was going to be the next big industry, a logical follow-on to radio. But being in this meter reading and semi-computing uh, kind of thing began to get to me, and by the time I uh, started working for IBM instead of this company and still going to school, I, the nature of the work kept changing. I don't know whether you know it or not, Frizz, but I was involved in designing uh, an automatic turret and gun sighting mechanism no. for tanks during no, I didn't the war. Know that. <laughs> and, uh, I used to see IBM fire control directors though when I was working on the radars. Well, that's not <laughs> something. Well, made me feel at home. Anyhow, uh, when I was through with college, <coughs> I went to work in, uh, in Endicott. Uh, I was the first electronic major to work to come to Endicott in four years. That was 1945. Did you go to college? Pardon? Where did you go to college? Cornell. That's right, you mentioned that. Yeah. Well, what, what were they normally hiring? They weren't. <coughs> they just didn't hire. They, they made do with what they had, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the work that went on in that laboratory was, during the war, was essentially ordnance type work or uh, punch card work and so on. Mm -hmm. They didn't have too many electronic people even before the war, and those that they did have, as I mentioned before, <coughs> left to go with the Army and Navy security agency work by and large. So one thing led to another. Uh, uh, it happened that Ralph Palmer got out of the Navy at about that point, maybe six, seven months after I went to work in Endicott. In passing through Endicott, he and I chatted. He suggested that I might like to come to Poughkeepsie. <coughs> and I suggested that that was probably a great thing to do because I was not very happy <coughs> designing relay circuits. <laughs> and uh, so in 1946, I moved to Poughkeepsie. I, I had didn't know you were there that early, 46. Yeah. I had one funny incident. Uh, after I came to work with IBM on the 604, machine number 10, I've forgotten where the first nine went, the 10th one went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to a Dr. Offelman, who was then with the carbon carbide. And I'd been out of that office for what, a year and a half or whatever, two years maybe. And the machine wasn't working, so Bill Mayer sent me down there to, to help the field engineer get the thing going. And I knew this Dr. Ruffelman. He, he also knew Mr. Oh, Mr. Watson very well. He was raising hell about this machine, so they sent me down. They'd, the company didn't know I knew this guy. And I walk in his office, uh, you know, here comes the guy, the expert from out of town, going to get the machine going. I walk in, he's all set to chew me out. And he looks, he says, what the hell are you doing here, Will? <laughs> he says, I come down and get your toy going. <laughs> so, they sent their secret weapon down. It was, so it was some strange. Yeah. I've been out of there two years and I'm right back in my old office uh, yeah. trying to get a computer calculator going. But the, uh, while I was in college and working for IBM, I really felt that electronic computing was going to be a big thing. And I was really torn between the television thing, in which I still had a great interest and, and knowledge, and the computer thing, which I had less knowledge because there was less there. Uh, but it was a very fortunate set of circumstances. If it hadn't been for that, working for that small company that got bought by IBM, I probably I probably would have stayed with the television industry. Which has not been very creative. No. No, nothing like as exciting to my way of thinking as the, uh, as the computer business. What did you know of electronic computers in college? You didn't know about any of that, did you? No. 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 I didn't know anything. There, were, there was no electronic computers. All I knew was that I knew electronics, and I knew that IBM 
the company I was working for was in the punch card business and that 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 these things did information processing, didn't even call them computers. And in talking with the professors, you know, well, there's no reason why certain mathematical things can't be mechanized. Uh, did you know about Turing's paper then? No. I didn't learn about that until after I knew that. I first heard of it from that. <laughs> and stored programs and a few other things. Uh, did you know about differential uh, analyzer? Mm-hmm. The neighbor Bush. I went to Sloan School here too. <laughs> when? I was in 1957, the second class, the executive class that Howard Johnson was running, uh, 1957, March of 57. I think we met in a building, I don't know, Procter and Gamble building, was it? The, the, the company bought. That's that. It's Lever Brothers. Lever Brothers. Yeah. Oh, Lever um, Brothers. Lever yes. Brothers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lived in that nice. Place down in Dedham, the end he got out. Is that still a... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, I get a lot of publications. Um, there was one area that we sort of slept over a little bit that might be interesting to develop further. Um, the, the actual architecture of the 701, why did you choose binary versus decimal numbers? Why parallel instead of serial? <coughs> um, the same questions everybody else had to address, but why did you go that way? And what influenced you, perhaps? Where's the culprit? They, uh, it went something like this. Uh, I, I, I cut my eye teeth on binary computers. Row N1 was a binary computer, and the, the IAS was, uh, von Neumann's machine was a binary computer. But when we were thinking about what IBM needed, we concluded it was decimal. And also we were concerned with having records on magnetic tape that were, uh, that did the same thing that a punch card did. If you've looked at a punch card, it's divided in fields. There, there's a name field and a salary field or whatever is, is supposed to be on the card. Uh, and so we, we were concerned with putting alphabetical information in and numbers in, and in a way that people could recognize. And so we designed the tape processing machine to do this. And that was actually a big machine that was constructed uh, and sort of ran. Uh, and was, the, and was the predecessor of the 702, which really ran. That was a good machine. Uh, and so Heard had, uh, uh, was, was involved, Cuthbert Heard was involved in uh, the market situation and the, the, the CPC and the developing requirement. And he was, he was sure he could sell these machines. And so he came around to talk to us about what to get. So the first thing we thought was, well, here we have this decimal technology. Well, can we do it with that? Well, it turned out we couldn't. And uh, uh, the, we would have had to design a completely different sort of machine to uh, solve partial differential equations. With the tape processing machine, we were primarily concerned with handling information, handling files, handling unit records, and so forth. Uh, and here, suddenly, we had large amounts of calculation. And we'd sacrificed the calculating speed in order to to to, to process the type of information that IBM's customers were dealing with. And uh, so then, then came the question of wh whether it should, so anyway, we, we, we visualized a, a, parallel, a parallel computer uh, modeled after von Neumann's uh, computer. Uh, and, and the question is, should it be decimal or binary? And uh, Heard was in favor of making it binary. And, and I finally came around to that point of view uh, with the following argument. If, if we made it a decimal machine, uh, it would be almost impossible for IBM to come out with a binary machine subsequently. And the reason for this is that IBM creates a huge internal environment. Most of the people who work from IBM, who work for IBM, never hear anything except from another IBMer in, in their work. I mean, they, you know, they, they're not really in contact with anything but IBM. And so if, if IBM, with a huge number of decimal machines in the market, uh, punch card machines, came out with a, a decimal calculator, decimal computer, uh, it would be just about impossible to ever break loose and, and go into binary. Whereas right now, we could sell a binary computer, Heard could sell it, and uh, if we did that, we'd have the freedom to use binary, which is better for a lot of purposes. And so this was 
part of my rationale in going going for that. And I don't know who exactly who made the final decision, but you you recall, Jerry, how it went? It was, I think that it was a, a a relatively safe decision because practically all, if not all, of the uh, individual projects going out to universities were binary right. in the first instance. Would binary take a lot less hardware than the decimal? Not a lot less, but but less. And so uh, wasn't faster. the Univac a parallel processor? Univac didn't exist at that time. Yeah, the Univac did. Yes. Not seven to one time. Sure. No, no, not not the seven to one time. The, the Univac was the, was the serial machine, like the tape processing machine, and it was it was decimal, and for the yeah. same reason because I think they were looking at the same market we were looking at. I suspect. I don't. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, and well, uh, so so that that I think that's that's how that's how it became a binary machine. The same sorts of issues arose on the parallel versus serial processing. I mean, your, the 701 was parallel. Parallel. The 702 was serial. Right. There's a reason for that, though. It's the number crunching. Yeah, yeah the, re the reason is that you know, uh, we were very severely limited in the speed with which uh, the circuits would run. And uh, by, by doing it in parallel, you could perform a multiplication or an addition, but especially a multiplication uh, very much faster. Uh, and, and, and there were, there were we, we made some significant innovations in the arithmetic unit of, uh, of, of the 701, some inventions. Uh, that I get one, one that I got an outstanding, I participated in and got an outstanding invention award for was the, to increase the speed of the um, arithmetic. And uh, so that, uh, and when you're solving a partial differential equation, you have to do an awful lot of arithmetic. Yes. And so that was, the, that was the reason for making it parallel. Now, uh, the NORC uh, was also a parallel machine, but it was, a de it was decimal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Every, everything was organized in a decimal way. Was the addressing of memory decimal in the NORC? I don't remember that. I don't remember, but that, that was another problem, that if you, if you addressed memory in a decimal way, uh, that would make the memory very inefficient. Whereas if you uh, had a decimal computer and you addressed memory in a binary way, you'd have a discontinuity at an important point in the machine. I mean, if, you, if when you computed something, uh, it came out as a decimal number and you had to convert it to a binary number to find out what the address was, then you'd be in trouble, and so uh, the, it was. It was a good thing to uh, make this binary, so that IBM would have the freedom, which IBM still has. And now we have lots of binary machines, and the, the 360 and 370 are both binary and decimal. But the addressing is binary. Memory, memory is addressed binary, as it should be. It was 36 bits because that is essentially 10 decimal digit precision. But then, what was the reason for going to serial on the uh, uh, commercial machines? Because the commercial machines didn't require a great deal of number crunching internal to the computer. It was more a matter of running one file of tape against another with very simple comparisons or arithmetic operations being done. And since tape was serial in the first instance, there's no reason to go parallel internal to the machine. You didn't need that much computing capacity per word of input. Uh, the, the feeling in a scientific computer always has been that you had relatively little input output, but for instance, you, you, you could feed in the elements of a matrix and then, you know, do multiplying and so forth all day long on those few elements. But well, one company came and visited the uh, 701 program, it was Time Life, and I remember their interest was uh, keeping track, no mathematic, keeping track of uh, all their, the addresses of everybody has their magazines, and when you have to make a change and there's a lot of people move every month, uh, <clears throat> that's the problem, it's not a, a mathematical problem, it's a problem of tracking people. Wow, I mean, it's and uh, matter of fact, they uh, they do that out in Boulder, Colorado, uh, for a lot of companies. Uh, well, that 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 was the way we pictured the uh, commercial application at that time, and the way we pictured it was to look at what we saw our customers doing, and say how would we uh, uh, and part of what they were doing they were doing with punch card machines, and part of what they were doing they were doing with clerks, and so we visualized how you would have a computer do what 
that's doing now. We had not visualized uh, the kind of the kind of thing that is done now, where uh, companies uh, uh, make experiments and try to emulate what what would happen if they made certain decisions. And we hadn't visualized uh, displays uh, which uh, require a whole lot of computing to support. And so it turns out now that uh, the computers that are being used in business uh, require <coughs> a great a great deal of processing speed. <coughs> but at the time, there was no market for that and no understanding of how to do it, no understanding of how to apply <coughs> these mathematical techniques to the problems that the businessmen were solving. <coughs> Still. It's, Excuse me. It's funny that in, in explaining why you needed the computing power of a parallel processor like the 701, though, we used, we used a matrix multiplication. But since most people wouldn't understand why the hell you would want to multiply one matrix against another, what we did was was give an application of matrix multiplication in terms of a parts explosion. You have one matrix which is your production requirement by month for machines A through Z, let's say. And then you have another matrix which is parts 1 through 3000 that are in part the uh, machines A through Z. And you multiply those two things in order to get your requirement for parts, 1 through 3,000 over the months, January through whatever. That's a simple thing to describe to business people. All right? It's really a matrix multiplication. And by the time you go through and say you multiply this number by that number, then this number by this number, and, this, and you keep adding these products, you keep going across here and down here, and after you're all through doing that, you take the resulting sum of those products and you plug it into one square of the answer. Now you've got to do this and do it for all the squares. And suddenly it dawns on them, that, boy, that's a lot of multiplications and additions, you see. May I give you another feeling Please. for the uh, Please. for the for the ambience? I'm gonna quote from this panel.